Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Rails Online Roundtable using the Slate Data Dashboard. Um, my name is Dan Bostrom. I'm the Rails Director of Marketing and Communications. I just want to note that today's event is being recorded. Uh, we will send out a version of the recording to everyone that registered, so we appreciate you getting signed up. Um, we're going to get started in a second here, but before we do, I just want to run quickly through the agenda. Uh, so we're going to do some quick updates on Rails uh, happenings, um, and then I'm going to turn things over to Jeanette in a second. Uh, Jeanette will do her presentation. We'll do a Q&A where you have the opportunity to ask questions and interact uh, a little bit with the data dashboard. Um, and then we will bring this to a close definitely by 5 p.m. So uh, we really appreciate you joining us. Just some quick notes. Um, some things I want to mention, uh, eRead Illinois Boundless is our shared catalog of books and audiobooks. Um, if your library is already a member, um, it's time to renew. And uh, all renewals are due by May 31st, 2024. Um, and then your membership year will officially start uh, on July 1st. Um, new libraries, this is a terrific time to join. Um, so you can join now and all your membership fees are, are waived until July 1st. So you'll enjoy access to uh, that 70,000 uh, book ebook and audiobook collection uh, in May, April, May, and June at no additional cost. Uh, but this is only for new libraries. Uh, it's a little bit of a sneak peek. Um, and if you do this, uh, your library will be vo uh, invoiced for a full year subscription starting after July 1st. So uh, please do consider this as a wonderful resource. Uh, there's an upcoming webinar that I'd like to tell you a little bit about. It's called When Generations Connect, When, uh, when Generations Connect, Navigating Generational Dynamics. Uh, the presenter is Phil Gwoki, uh, and this takes place on Wednesday, April 24th, uh, 10 to 11.30 a.m. Uh, Phil's going to uh, address uh, topics like attitudes, uh, work styles, and values in the workplace as it relates to generations, and how to harness an environment where everyone feels empowered, valued, and understood. Uh, this is open to anyone working in a Rails library, um, and you can find this event in the L2 calendar. That's how you'll sign up. Okay, so those are my updates. Um, it is now my pleasure to turn this over to Jeanette. Uh, Jeanette Durucki is the Rails Data Research Specialist. Um, I'm so excited about this uh, about this resource. I know everyone at Rails is as well. It's already hugely beneficial to our schools uh, and the and the folks working in the school libraries. Um, Jeanette's here to walk you through it. Um, she's been hard at work at this for a long time, uh, and I can promise you that no one knows this topic better than Jeanette. So Jeanette, I'm going to stop uh, sharing, and you are welcome to take over. Okay, thank you so much for the opportunity to share the dashboard with everyone. I appreciate everyone making time to join us today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen so that you can go ahead and take a look at the dashboard. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the project while you're um, just looking at this landing page. but. Um, this is a project that began two years ago. You may have heard it previously referred to as the School Library Data Project. Um, it began um, as it, like it was spurred by um, some findings from the Slide Project, which is an IMLS grant funded project that um, just ended last fall. It was a three year project um, spearheaded by Keith Curry Lance and Deb Cockle that was exploring the nationwide evolution of school librarianship and whether that was. Um, in, in a profession that was evolving or whether it was in decline. So um, when they were looking at data for every state in the nation, they came across Illinois and our data was lacking. There was about half of the data for our school libraries was not represented at the national level. So they reached out to some library organizations in Illinois to see what we could do to help them find that. And as a result, the School Library Data Project was launched by Rails. So um, I joined Rails at, to begin that project. Um, I've been happy to work on that as my primary focus the two years that I've been at Rails. Um, I have learned a lot, as Dan mentioned. I um, have gotten to know a lot of folks in the school library community and their data very well. So um, what we have been looking at through the Slate Project, which stands for School Library Advocacy Through Education, is um, staff collection and finance data. And we've been collecting that over two years via surveys, um, the annual certification process, which is in actually just get, getting ready to wrap up here in the next couple of weeks. 
um, and some other methods that, you know, research and things that were being conducted by other organizations. Um, the Dominican iSchool had a project that we've used data from. Um, IEL, the um, Association of Illinois School Library Educators was doing their own kind of little data um, gathering project. So we've been able to put a, pull a lot of that together and um, gain some general insights about school libraries in Illinois. And then we're sharing some of that in the dashboard as well as like a deeper look at the um, status of each school and district in the state. So um, let me first just talk about how, how to access the dashboard. Um, probably the easiest way is via the Rails website. If you go to the bottom, there's a section that says current issues, the library pulse. If you click the data analysis link, that will take you to, um, <clears throat> There's a section on the right where you'll select School Library Advocacy Through Education, which is the page for the project. And then there's a link to the dashboard on that page. So it's probably the easiest way. It'll take you to Tableau Public where the dashboard's currently hosted right now. Um, and then you'll see the view that, that I'm showing here on my screen. This is what I call the landing page. And um, I really want this to be a discussion. So if you have questions or you need um, further clarification on something as I'm going through it, please feel free to interrupt me. I know Dan offered to monitor the chat for me, so I really appreciate that. Um, but ask questions as you have them and we'll try to address it while we're looking at that screen together. Um, from this screen, we really wanted to bring people here and give them an introduction to why school libraries are, are important. You know, the school librarians I worked with, I worked with a team of 21 librarians to develop this site. And one of the things they said was when people come to this page, like we need to impress upon them, like, why do they care? Like, why is this important? Why should they keep looking and, and find the information that they want? So, you know, we try to add, include a little bit of information about why school libraries are important. There's some peer reviewed studies linked on the upper left corner of the, this page. Um, we're looking for more information to link that will be even you know, better to provide more support for that. Um, some resources to the right, so important library organizations that anybody might be interested in, school librarians might be interested in connecting with, or just the community at large. Um, and then just some other resources if you're interested in learning more about, you know, the Illinois School Report Card, um, the link to the Illinois State Library's um, School District Library Grant site, information about that, um, the My Library Is site, which is um, part of Rails, and then the slide project, which I mentioned earlier, and then a, a document that we put together called The Value of school libraries, which talks a lot about the duties and responsibilities that school librarians have and other the more data actually from other peer reviewed studies that support um, the presence of certified school librarians in every school. So uh, and we also wanted to include just some basic oversights from this study. So far, um, you know, the bottom center of this screen contains some of that information. One of the big, big challenges that we have found, the slide project shared that they found the same thing, was that uh, school library staff members are called more than 300 titles in Illinois. So if you go to a website looking for a school librarian, you may find a librarian, you may find someone who is an LRC director or an IMC director, or they're called a lot of different things, whether that's a librarian or a library support position, you know, it's, they're, they're called a multitude of different um, names. And then we wanted to kind of share that, um, you know, the number of schools in the state. So you get an idea of the scope of the project that we're looking at. And then also the scope of the student base that we're trying to provide services to through school libraries. So there's currently 852 public school districts in Illinois that equates to 3,849 public schools. And then there's about 1,042 schools that are registered with the State Board of Education. They are not required to register, but what we've looked at were the ones that have reached out and provided some information, basic background and enrollment and uh, student achievement and things like that to the State Board of Education. We've included them in this information because we feel like it's important. We don't wanna really ignore an entire sect of students that are um, you know, residing in our state. Um, when you get to the staffing part, you can see that there's only about 1,400 educators who hold a library information specialist endorsement. That is the standard for certification in Illinois. Um, you do not have to have an MLIS to be a certified school librarian. You have to have a prof professional educator's license. You have to, to get the endorsement, you'll have to take 18 hours of library and information science coursework at the master's level. Um, you have to pass a content like a subject area test and um, then you earn that endorsement from ISBE. 
Um, right now, about one out of every three library staff members that we've identified has that endorsement. And you can see that's about on par with, you know, one third of the schools roughly have access to someone who's certified now. You're, you know, just doing simple math, it looks like a third of the schools should have a certified librarian, but we also know that some schools have more than one <laughs> and some schools have none. So it's not really quite a one-to-one -one or one-to-three even really comparison. So, um, you know, one of the things that we are looking at that has come out of this project in our partnership with IL, the Illinois Library Association, the Illinois Heartland Library Associate, um, <clears throat> System, um, ILA, the state library, there's a whole group of organizations that meet monthly and we have talked about how to improve that um, pathway to certification for school librarians and so that we can increase this number to provide, you know, right now there's a, definitely a shortage. I think there's a teacher shortage nation, or nationwide, but definitely statewide. So school librarians are part of that. Um, is, there's a little piece here about funding, just some general overall information. Um, we are looking at specifically library budgets. So that's money that the district has allocated specifically to the library for expenditures. And right now, the range of funding is about $0.47 cents to $377.80. So there's a wide range. Um, the average is about $17 per student, which is on par with what is you know the ALA recommended level for highly effective school libraries. So that's good news. Um, the median was about $10.25. Um, 49% of districts in the state spend about $10 or less per student on library expenditures, and then 75% spend less than $20 per student. So that's the majority for sure in our state. Um, so you're probably wondering, like, where's the actual data? Or am I going to actually show you any information? I will. Um, so to select a district or a non-public school, you would choose this drop down here. And I've pre-selected Canton Union School District 66. Um, and you click the View District Details button, which will take you to the next screen. This is the, um, the district details screen. So in the upper left-hand corner is some basic information about this district. This comes directly from ISBE. And then also some information we've supplemented on if they're a member of a regional library system. Um, school districts are not required to. They have to meet membership criteria just like every other library in the state. So um, some choose not to, and some just simply unfortunately do not qualify for membership. So this will give you that information, a, a small map to kind of give you an idea of where that district is situated in the state, and then a list of the schools and locations in that district. Below that, it moves into the staff data. This is probably the area of data we have the most information about. We've focused very heavily on this just because it's such an integral part of advocating for school libraries and providing support, support to their staff members. Um, so we're in this district, it'll sh it shows there's a total of seven um, full-time equivalent district staff members. And now the full-time equivalent piece is important. And I wanna point that out because this isn't really a one-to-one people to full-time equivalent staff. So it, the way you want to think about it is looking at the number of hours per week someone works in the library, and then that number is taken is divided by the number of total hours they could work in the library that week. So if they are in the library, you know, 40 hours a week and it's a 40-hour work week, that's one FTE. If they are there 20 hours and it's a 40-hour work week, that's a 0.5. So the number should always represent representing any one person should always be one or less. Um, in this case, there's seven full-time equivalent staff members, um, one full-time equivalent certified library information specialist, and then the other staff member, the other six are all um, non-certified. And then it'll, it equates to a total of 11 positions. And this is also, you'll understand maybe better when I get to the building details, because this is going to take anyone who works in any building and that creates one position in that building. So also it may look like there's, you know, 11 staff members, but there's really seven um, because one individual is working in five different locations. So she equates to five different positions. And you, like I said, you'll see that'll become clearer when I show you the next screen. Um, below that, we're looking at the highest level of education attained and then library science education, this is really just to give us an idea of, you know, who is staffing schools, what kind of education and training do they have? How can the systems and other organizations provide support to them? One, um, one project that came out of this, you know, in tandem with the Slate project was this um, Illinois School Library Workers Symposium, which was held last fall. 
Um, that was a great event. A lot of people were able to take advantage of some training that was targeted towards staff members that did not have library backgrounds. So, I mean, I believe that, you know, Dan, correct me if I'm wrong, because Dan was a big part of um, planning that project, but it was, you know, primarily geared towards those people, but I don't think you turned anyone away, did you? No, yeah, I didn't think so. So anybody who wanted a refresher or just to kind of like hone their skills a little bit could take advantage of that as well. Um, because we know that there will be people visiting the dashboard who are maybe not in, working in the school library space or in the education space in general, we did include a little brief paragraph about certified library information specialists. Um, and what they are just is a very brief little blurb that they are, you know, licensed teachers who have an endorsement, they can click that ISBE logo to take them to the ISBE site to get more information about what that process entails and what those um, credentials are. To the right is the collections and library finance information. Collections is probably the area where we have the least amount of detailed information right now. It's very hard to collect this because of the way that we're gathering data. Um, when you gather data through certification, it all comes in pretty much at the district level. We've asked them to start specifying their staff member information at the building level so we get an idea of who's serving which buildings. But for collections, it's a little bit harder um, to get an idea to really know which schools have which materials and which ones are accessing which database and subscription resources. Um, because a lot of that is purchased through the district at the district level, but maybe not every building has access to it. Um, so for now, it's going to be shown on this page. It's a little bit misleading, and I've had a couple librarians in sessions I've um, had just recently ask me if there's going to be a way for them to kind of differentiate between their schools in the future. And the goal is yes. Like, um, I'll talk a little bit later about how we're going to change the data collection process, but one of the goals is to go more directly to school librarians to gather this information so that we have a better idea of which students in which buildings have access to which resources and how many. Um, right now, we're just looking at whether they conduct an annual inventory, and that's whether all the buildings in their district conduct an annual inventory. And um, in this case, it's yes. Uh, the number of print books they own, the number of ebooks they own. This does not count any ebooks that are accessed through resource sharing. Like, so if you subscribe to e read, those 70,000 titles are not going to show up on this screen, but e read will show up in the box to the right that talks about your database and subscription services. So that gives us an idea of, you know, really what your collection access is versus just what you purchased as a district. Um, and again, that ALA recommended number of materials per student is 15 to 20. So that's right here on the screen. There's also a link, this link, and then in the finance section, they both link to that same document, which is the characteristics of highly effective school libraries. Um, so that anybody who wants to take a look at that can. The finance information looks at, like I said, this library expenditure budget for the district. And then also whether or not they've received the Illinois State Library's school library district grant. Um, excuse me, <clears throat> um, with the budget information, pardon me one second, the, um, the team of librarians that I worked with were pretty adamant that they didn't want their budget totals kind of splashed out on this page. So in an effort to kind of protect that information a little bit, what we've done is created nine different buckets that we can place their um, budget category in, or their budget level per student. Okay into that level, into the one of those nine levels. And okay. in this case, this one is a level five. And <clears throat> excuse me, does someone need something? Okay, I just want to make sure I was hearing I was hearing someone. So I just want to make sure that there wasn't someone who needed um, had a question. Okay. Um, so with this, the information for the um, for the finances is again, you're looking to compare it to this recommended level of 12 to $15 per student. In this case, level five is $10 to $15. So it likely falls in that range or at least very close. Um, what we're hoping to do in the future is to be able to have a little bit more detailed information at the building level because we know different school libraries have programming budgets, they have supply budgets, they have uh, materials budgets, there's all different types of expenditures that they have. And some of the school librarians I've worked with have expressed an interest in knowing more about what that looks like at the different grade levels, whether you're a high school, elementary or middle school, or whether you are um, 
and where you're located in a rural school, urban, suburban, those types of things. Um, as far as the school library district grant information, um, this is really just, like I said, whether the district has received it or not, this is a, not a merit-based grant. Um, you have to definitely qualify for, there's some criteria to be a system member, and there's some other criteria that the state library looks at um, to get this grant. It's awarded at 88 and a half cents per student. And um, the minimum grant award currently is $850. That equates to a population or an enrollment of about 900 students in a district. So for a district to receive more than $850, they would have to have that um, exceed about, about 900 students in, in enrollment district-wide. Um, I do want to point out that 49% of the districts receive the minimum grant award. So that'll give you an idea of the of you know just the size of the districts that we have here in Illinois. They're not large. The majority of them are not. So um, you know, an $850 right now does not go a long way. So there is a little bit of a push um, in the library community. I've even talked to a couple people who are, you know, have connections to the state library that they have also heard from school librarians that there is an interest in seeing if that minimum can be raised. So we'll see where that goes. Um, hopefully, it, you know, even if it just comes up to $1,000, that would be a big help. But, you know, with the cost of materials increasing right now, it's, you know, it's uh, $850 isn't really going very far. So does anyone have any questions about anything on this screen before I continue on? Nope. All right. So if you're interested in viewing information about a specific building in a district, there's a button at the top left that says view building details and you'll click that. And then like when you first load the page, as you see here, um, it's pretty blank, right? So you'll have to pick a building from this table at the top before it'll display the information for that school. So I selected Canton High School. Um, it gives me their basic information, their street address, what county they're in, what grades are served, um, the locale type. This is taken from the National Center for Education Statistics. That's where, where you get that classification. And then if they belong to a resource sharing program, so an LSAP, this, one, this school belongs to RSA. Um, below that is going to be a little bit more staff information. I'm going to get into that later. I'll just touch on these other kind of center sections first. Um, the district details at the top are copied over from the previous screen just for reference. So you have an idea of, you know, still what you're looking at in case that information becomes relevant to something you're looking at on the screen. There's some demographic information. For now, this is just race and ethnicity information. And we have it at the building level, the district level, and the state level. That's what the three different bars are. You can see the code is over here to the right to go through all of these different classifications. This is again provided by ISBE. So that's, we're not gathering this information directly. We are really just resupplying information that's publicly available and tying it to some other information that we have here. <clears throat> I wanna spend a little bit more time, <clears throat> excuse me, talking about the staffing piece just because of the fact that um, the evidence-based funding formula information is, is available on this screen. I'm not sure that this is something a lot of people outside of education have of any familiarity with. And that's part of the reason why we wanted to include it in, in this view, because it is pretty important, especially to school librarians. So um, if you look at this, the far right at the top, there's some basic information. Each of these is a little bubble that if you hover over it, it's going to show you more information about that particular topic. Evidence-based funding is a formula that is based on legislation that was passed in 2017 that basically guarantees core personnel that are essential to a student's minimum standard of learning for success. Okay, it includes, I, I'll actually show you, here's the core personnel list right here. It's teachers, specialists, instructional facilitators, core intervention teachers, substitutes, guidance counselors, nurse, supervisory aides, librarians, and librarian aides, the principal, the assistant principal, and then school site staff. That last one to me is a little bit vague, so I'm not really sure exactly what's included in that, but the important piece for us is that librarians and library aides are included, and there is a recommended staffing level, and we've included that information here as well. Um, if you want to know more about evidence-based funding, there, like, there's a link right here at the bottom that takes you to ISBE's website to probably the best basic information I could find about that. Um, before I move on, I, I will talk about the fact that the evidence-based funding formula does take into consideration your tax base when in the formula. So for people to say, you know, 
um, this staffing level or my adequacy target and your adequacy target is basically the district's ability to meet the requirements of the formula on its own before state assistance. The adequacy target will take into consideration whether you are in Northern Illinois, Southern Illinois, what kind of industry you have because your tax base and other things are, fe are factored into that equation already. So you can always go into this knowing that that's already been accounted for in some way, shape or form. So you can feel free to make some comparisons. Um, when you, the ISBE takes each district and, fact, and figures out their evidence-based funding formula and their adequacy target and their um, percent of adequacy, then they categorize them and group them into four tiers based on how much assistance they need from the state. And an important thing to mention here is that the state gives over $300 million every year to school districts to meet this formula. And what we do know from staffing levels and staffing inadequacies is that they're not necessarily funding the core personnel requirements. So um, one of the pieces we did include here is I mentioned the student to teacher ratio for library and library staff. This varies by elementary, middle, and high school. Um, it's included in this table right here. But you'll see that for at elementary and middle schools, you should have one librarian for every 450 students. Um, that doesn't mean that if you have 225, you have a, a part-time librarian. The minimum is one. So it's any any number up to 450 students. And then at, for high schools, it's uh, for every 600 students, you would want one librarian. And then in at all levels, it's 300 to one for this um, student to staff ratio for library support personnel or library and aides, which is what they're calling them here. So across the bottom, we've included the information that we have for this building, um, is their current staff level, and then what we've identified to be their targets for evidence-based funding. So evidence-based funding takes your uh, last three years of enrollment and averages them, and that's what they use to create the targets for the formula. So what we're looking at here is this Canton High School currently has a district library, and this is where I said it might make more sense when I say there's seven full-time equivalents and 11 staff positions. You can see their district librarian for this school counts as 0.2 because she spends equal amounts of time in all five schools. So her actual time is 0.2. This is the number of positions, so one. Um, if there was, if this number was like 0.5 and there was a two here, then you would know that there was more than one person, you know, sharing that full-time equivalency. Um, library clerks, this is not a certified library information specialist, um, works full-time in this building only, and that's one, a single person. When you go over here, it's taking this information and just putting it into a bar chart to compare it with those evidence-based targets. And so the current staff level for this building is 1.2 full-time equivalent staff members, and this school should have 3.15. And then the next four bars kind of break that apart into the certified staff or librarians, and then the um, other library, what we're calling other library staff, and then they would consider librarian aides through evidence-based funding. So it's, you know, they should have a minimum of at least one librarian, and they currently have point, uh, point 0.2 FTE. And then they have one full-time other staff member and they should have 2.1. So the chart, the table over in the far right corner is really just kind of a repetition of the same information, but um, it laid out a little bit differently for people who process it differently. So, you know, sometimes people want to look at the length of the bar charts and that's the difference. And sometimes people want to see the actual numbers. The colors do correspond. There's a huge, a great correlation there between, um, you know, each, each of these charts so you can associate them. Any questions about anything on this screen? Y'all are a quiet group. I barely made it through this presentation in an hour when I was in Champaign. So uh, we're just flying right through it. Oh, oh no, it's fine. Let me just mute this. It's... All right, so um, that's really it for the dashboard. Is there um, anything, any visit, anybody have any specific questions about any particular features? Otherwise, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what, you know, what I plan for the future. All right, um, so going back to this district screen, or let me go back here. Hold on. Um, something that we would like to add to this screen would be 
um, the overlap between the school districts and the public library districts that serve it or feed into it and what that looks like, because we feel like that's a really important piece of information for people to have to understand, because I think there's a, a misconception that if your school library doesn't have something, you can just go to the public library, but not everyone has that access. Um, or that capability, whether it be because of transportation barriers or just you don't get public library service or your public library doesn't have the materials that you need. So there's a lot of different reasons that that could be really important. Um, so we're hoping to add that information as well. Um, another thing that I plan to develop is um, a comparison tool. So you would be able to compare between districts, um, whether it's, you know, uh, on this screen, particularly listing districts side by side, most likely it'll be a separate screen. You'll choose the districts that you would like to view. And as um, one librarian put it, it would be consumer report style. So it's gonna be columns for each district and then you'll have a line for every metric that you would like to look at side by side so that you can get an idea of what this looks like from a funding perspective, staffing perspective. You know, a lot of times when we talk to school librarians, they're talking about, you know, oh, we always compare ourselves to the district, the next closest district or things like that. And in some cases, that's great. You have to compare yourselves to your neighbors, just proximity did make some, determine some of those relationships. But in a lot of ways, those comparisons are probably not the best. So, you know, maybe there's a complete difference in funding base, complete difference in population size. Um, you know, you just don't really want, you wanna make sure that you're making the right comparisons when you're comparing information. Um, specifically, if you're choosing to use this to advocate for additional resources, additional funding within your own district. So, I mean, that is definitely one of the ways that we're encouraging school librarians to use this tool is to under, have a better understanding of what resources they have available. Um, some of them are using it to un, have a better understanding of the school buildings that are feeding into theirs, whether <laughs> because in um, Illinois, we have a lot of different types um, of school districts. So, you know, not everything is a unit district where kids flow nicely, you know, up through their school levels within the same district. There's a lot of districts that kind of um, split and come back together, you know, in different ways as kids matriculate up from kindergarten through high school. So, you know, they we want them to be able to kind of follow that path in some ways. Um, I would love to have a feeder pattern <laughs> portion of this dashboard that has been that's going to be a long term goal for me, I think, because of the fact that the feeder patterns are so hard to wrangle in the state just because um, for ISBE, I think it, they said that more than half of your students have to go on to the next building for it to be considered a feeding pattern. And we know that in some cases that's not the case, but we still want to be able to follow each student and the possible paths they could take. So um, that'll take a little bit more work and a little bit more time for us to kind of flesh that out. Um, as far as comparisons, um, school librarians have said they want to be able to compare um, staff members based on like their contract types even. Um, that's something I haven't really explored too much just yet. Like, you know, if they're um, a 10 month and 12 month contract, what does that look like? Are there, are you more likely to be full-time if you have a 12 month contract or if, are you more likely to be part-time? What, you know, what that kind of breaks down to. Um, and a big, big piece, um, a big goal is to have more student outcome information in this table so that you can directly see the correlation between a presence of a school library and then whether the certification or training of the staff correlates to students having better success. And there's a lot of national peer reviewed research that talks about the fact, I mean, actually global, if you wanna really go to that scale, um, we know that the presence of a school library for one does make an impact, but also trained professionals in staffing those libraries makes a big difference in student success. So um, we wanna be able to show that um, for schools because I think that's gonna be a big tool for school librarians to take you know, to their administrators, to their school boards, to be able to advocate for their, you know, their positions. Um, I had a woman ask me just a couple of weeks ago if I could help her put together some support to, she's, she wants to get um, a library aid. She really, really needs one. And so it was, you know, talking through the information that she already has in her, in her hands, you know, with circulation data, um, 
visit data, all the types of material, her collection statistics, anything that you can use to show, you know, how things are being used in the library, who is visiting, how many students do you see per day, all of those things are really essential. And that's essential component of the advocacy piece that we're looking at here. Um, as far as people outside of the school library community and how I would see them using this dashboard, I mean, it's really just looking at the school districts. If you are a public library, um, if you sense it, if you have your own students or family members in a public school or any school, um, you know, look at the overlap of what's happening in those districts, whether it's your agency, your service area overlaps with a school district boundary, or you know people who are in those areas, be informed and understand what the resource um, situation is like in that school district. And then, you know, a lot of people are talking about forming partnerships. There are already a lot of great public library, school library partnerships that I'm aware of. Um, and I think there are more and more of those forming just simply because of the limitations that everyone has budget-wise, resource-wise. Um, I do hope that the Secretary of State's statewide database package is going to make a big impact on that because there is a K through 12 component specifically stated in the um, request for proposals. But um, I guess we're all, you know, everyone in the library community is kind of waiting to see what's going to happen with that. And um, I'm right there along with them. So I think that that could really do a lot for, you know, not just increasing library service statewide to everyone in Illinois, but also for schools uh, particularly. Um, I, I really want to encourage you, I know we just had election day yesterday, but um, make sure that you're voting in your local elections. Um, it's important for your library boards, for public library boards, but it's also important for your school boards. So, you know, like I think about the district that I live in, I don't, my kids are grown, they're adults, they, I don't send anyone to my local school, but I still research the school board members, I still want to make sure that their values are aligned with mine, and that they support school libraries. Um, you know, especially right now, a lot of them are making sure to mention that in their platforms, you will see that very clearly the affiliate organizations that they're affiliating themselves with, some of them will flat out state, um, you know, I trust the professional opinion of school librarians, and I'm thinking, yes, that's what I'm looking for in a candidate, but make sure that you know who is in your school board making those decisions, you know, we have, we hear in stories from school librarians all the time about the challenges that they're facing. Some of them are coming from the school boards and those are people with less information or knowledge about how school libraries are run or even libraries in general or the types of um, training and backgrounds that librarians have. So I think it's really important to make sure that you have an informed community as well. Um, if you are so moved to do this, I would uh, really encourage you to reach out to your school administrators to tell them that it's important for you to have schools in your district that have school libraries, for one. Um, you know, some people ask me all the time, they're like, what's the goal of your project? I'm like, first off, the goal is a school library in every school because we are not there yet. And I feel like that's a little bit um, of a detriment to the students of Illinois, for sure. Um, and I feel like that's an attainable goal. And, you know, then it would be a certified librarian in every school library. So that's, you know, we talked about before, I'll go back to this page where we're looking at, you know, the statistics and we have a school library short, school librarian shortage, definitely a certified school librarian shortage, which we're hoping to, you know, work on. It's, it's going to take some time to ramp up the profession to the point where we could have a certified librarian in every school, but that is definitely the goal um, to have, you know, someone who knows um, libraries, the type of work that they do. You know, the other thing I talk about a lot with school librarians is the, the tasks that they're assigned. And it's like, you know, if you think about if you work in a library or you've ever worked in a library, you know, you know, there's the reference desk, you've got the circulation, you've got, all, but a school librarian does all of those things. Like they do essentially every library function in one job. So, you know, they have to be very well-rounded with their library knowledge, and we want to make sure that they're getting the training and the support that they need. Um, I'm trying to look through my notes to see if there's anything else um, that I forgot, I failed to mention about kind of the future. Oh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the data collection process. So um, currently, I mentioned that we are using the annual certification for school librarians to complete information. I think I'm most every library type supplies some additional information through certification right now, but we are, this will be the last year, I'm sure school librarians everywhere in Illinois are cheering that this will be the last year that, that information is part of the certification process, but 
Um, there will be a new process that's created that will move off of that certification piece and it will be completely separate questionnaire for them to fill out. It's going to have some more information, but we are, I'm working very closely with Leah Gregory, who is the school library liaison at Illinois Heartland Library System to develop resources for school librarians to prepare them for this process so that they'll have an idea of where to find the information that they need, what, you know, what is included in each metric that we're looking at. But the goal is for it to be able to give us better, more detailed information. I'm going to go back to this district screen. And we talked about before, you know, this collection piece, it's having a better understanding of, you know, which resources are available to each school. You know, if I say this district has 21,000 print books, but maybe, maybe 15,000 of them are in the high school. I don't know that from this information right here, but I do want to know that. I want to have a better idea of, you know, what type of targets are they meeting? What's the average reading level of their collection? Are they, you know, is it too heavy on research materials? Is it, you know, fiction to nonfiction comparisons, things like that. So that's information that they have readily available in their ILS already. And I think that it could be useful for um, school libraries in general. And a lot of librarians have said that, you know, they're not looking at this information to judge in any way, shape or form. They're just trying to understand if they are where they need to be, like what's the baseline for what service level I should be at? Should, how many materials do I need? Do, you know, I've, I just received an email last week from someone asking me for targets about things like, you know, diversity of my collection, um, you know, the fiction versus nonfiction breakdown and like social emotional learning goals and things like that. For schools, that's really important. And those are hot button issues right now. And Illinois is not a state that has developed any statewide um, standards for that. There are some states that have statewide school library standards that address all of those things. Um, they even set their own materials per student goals and things like that. But unfortunately, we have, we're not there yet. So hope, I mean, maybe in the future, eventually we will be. That would be a great long-term goal for us, I think. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, we're, we have a lot of potential. There's a lot more information that we can look at and try to make some meaningful um, comparisons and find some relationships that we can really apply to some uh, advocacy and support. But yeah, so thank you so much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Like if anybody, like I said, if anyone has a question, I would appreciate, you know, hearing from you or you can always email me afterwards. My contact information is, I think, all over this dashboard. So um, I don't think you can miss it. Well, well, while people are thinking about questions, uh, I, I I had one for you, Jeanette, and um, and you you covered it a little bit and talking about the person that asked you sort of about um, you know adding an aid right and using this is like what what are what sort of questions are you getting right now? What do you this has been my for about a month? Like what what sort of things are you hearing from people? What are people telling you about this resource? How are they using it? So, I mean, the feedback I've received so far has been largely, largely positive. Um, I think there's only been one, one person has kind of reached out and said, you know, I'm worried about too much information being out there. And so I was able to kind of talk with them about the privacy concerns that they had. And, you know, that's something I didn't mention earlier. The staff information that's on this website will always be confidential. We'll never ask you for your name. Nobody's name will ever be you know, splashed out on this screen for everyone to see just because it is widely available. And, you know, I want people to understand that we are taking this very seriously. Like we want, there's nothing about this that um, in any way, shape or form should hinder your work as a school librarian or hopefully negatively impact anyone. So if, you know, if people are experiencing those types of things, we want them to reach out. So I appreciated that contact. But otherwise, you know, people are, I, I've gotten if your information is wrong in this dashboard, please let me know. I had a couple of people say that like, I didn't want to tell you, but it's like, we know that there's information in here that's incomplete. Um, you know, unfortunately, when you're doing um, data collection through a process like annual certification at the district level, you're asking for someone to get a lot of information. Some school districts in Illinois are very, very large. And we understand that that's a huge undertaking to pull all that together. You know, the notes that we get are very, they're so nice and very cute, but they're, you know, this is just a, our best guess. And it's like, that's all we can really ask people to do, right? But we do think that taking the data collection to the building level will help with some of that. It will ease a little bit of that burden going certifications already uh, not a super lengthy process, but it's pretty involved. 
So, you know, it'll take that away from the certification contact for that district and then maybe give it to the people who have better hands on, um, you know, access to that information. Um, people want to know, you know, it's questions like, you know, OK, you said my level is, you know, uh, 10 to 15, 14 to 99 per student is my budget, you know, per capita spending. And it, you said 12 to $15 per student. Is that really the same for every district? You know, we're getting cl clarification questions, um, just people who are just trying to understand, you know, how best to approach um, using this to advocate for additional staff members funding, um, you know, the questions about whether putting their database and subscription services out there is going to have any impact on the statewide database package, you know, are they going to look at this and see what we all use? And it's like, well, no, not really. But um, in some way, shape or form, yes, we will be able to provide that information to them if, they, if it's asked for. So that's great, a great resource and tool to have. Um, a lot of it, the questions we get are about things like education, um, access to those types of programs, access to additional training. You know, um, if I am looking for to connect with someone from another district who has more training than I have and they're nearby, like, can you help me do that? And we're steering people to L2. I will, this is my L2 commercial. I do it, I think, in every session that I put on, but it's if you do not have an account through librarylearning.org, please establish one um, because it is not just a calendar of events like the one that we're in right now, but it is also a directory. So it's your ability to access or find other people that you wanna connect to to ask them for information about their district through this dashboard. Um, I am hesitant to provide that type of connectivity in the dashboard itself, um, just for safety considerations. So L2 is definitely the way to go. I hope that helps, Dan. <laughs> it was kind of very, a lot. Very much so. Very <laughs> much so. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the L2. Obviously, I love the L2 plug. I can't uh, get I can't get enough. I think in school libraries, L2 gets overlooked a lot just because so much of yep. their information comes through the education stream. And we want to make yep. sure that they're really connected to the library community too, because that is a place of great support. Um, we have heard from a lot of I mean, several different public librarians asking, you know, what I can do to support the school libraries in my area. And some of them already have um, intergovernmental agreements. Some don't. You know, some of them even have um, school library liaisons. So it's trying to, you know, get those people connected um, in the right way. And again, L2 is a good resource for us to ref refer them to to make those connections. You talked about, yeah, and you talked about L2, uh, and, you know, L2 is a data collection tool for us as well, right? It's it's a way mm -hmm. that we track our, our libraries, and, and it's not just us. It's, you know, it's our uh, sibling system, Illinois Heartland Library System. It's the Illinois State Library. So, um, yeah. Uh, right. Angela, Angela has a comment. As a public librarian, a community that does not have very good school libraries. I find this information to be very useful advocating for our profession. Absolutely. Uh, why right. would kids want to come to the public library when the school library has been has little to be desired? Yeah, I've been trying so very hard to work with our schools. Administrative roadblocks are huge. I'll keep trying. Thank you, Angela. Yeah, sometimes that's the only thing you can do is keep trying. It is really hard. And I will say this, like um, one of the biggest hurdles in the education community, and maybe this isn't well known to librarians in general, is um, the administration kind of sets the tone for pretty much everything. So if you are a public librarian and you know that your school libraries are lacking in the area that you're serving, reach out to your school librarians directly for sure, but then also try to befriend or approach, and maybe the school librarian can do this better, but even if you go together to collaborate on some kind of a contact with the administrator to under help them hopefully understand that school libraries are an integral part of student success and also building the community, right? So, um, you know, the more resources that school libraries have, the less pressure on public libraries necessarily to provide those resources when school libraries can't. Um, everyone is working with limited funds. It's not like we're all out here, you know, making tons of money and, you know, our profit margins are increasing or anything like that. Unfortunately, we're not corporate America. So it's it's just a different way of um, funding. And we have to all be very mindful of what we have and work within our means. So um, I really think that it's it's 
very helpful for school librarians too. Um, and I know that I'm not trying to put the burden on public librarians for sure, but when they have public librarians reach out to them, you know, they, it makes them, helps them feel not so alone. Some of them are the only librarian in a district and that might be the only school district in their county. So they really do feel isolated. And if they can connect with someone else who has some information or resources or even can just listen when they need them to, then that's all, that's the type of support that they're looking for. Yeah, and this is also a good point uh, to to talk about. You know, when you, when you mentioned the Illinois School Library Workers Symposium, and you know the work that you're doing, Jeanette, um, with uh, the Advocacy Academy or the uh, uh, Advocacy Administrator. Academy, right. Administrator, Administrator Academy, 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 right. Yeah, and just and the other efforts that are going on statewide, you know, with uh, as collaboration with uh, with ILE and with ILA and the Illinois Harvard Library System to you know, so so this is not just um, you know, this this tool is a very useful tool, but it's part of a larger, you know, effort to boost the profile of school libraries, um, right. talk about the necessity and, um, and, you know, and sometimes I think maybe that is um, not always as evident to the other types of libraries um, as it might be to, to school libraries. Well, and that, that's something I'm glad you brought that up because that is something I want to I wanted to mention going all the way back to the slide project even one of their main findings when that project wrapped up last fall was that part of the reason for the decline in school library staffing in the decline in school libraries in general is a priority, the priority of the administrators. So we just mentioned how important it is to build those relationships. And if, you know, for a lot of school librarians, it's very daunting. They're not really sure, you know, they're, if they're, um, employment is going to be at stake or in jeopardy in any way, if they kind of you know, start those conversations. So it can be helpful for them if they're building, like I said, that partnership or collaboration with a public library. But um, so we, what we need to do is really work on changing the attitude and the priorities of school administrators. And what we've found is they don't really learn a lot about school libraries when they're getting their education to become an administrator. So, you know, what we're, we're, we're looking at a couple different things. And Dan mentioned the Illinois Heartland Library System. And I, co I collaborate a lot with Leah Gregory. We do professional development events for school librarians. And we're working on this administrator academy, which we actually, um, kind of inherited from two ladies who, who have retired from the iSchool at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. So it's we were fortunate in that the bones of it are very, very good, and it's basically all fleshed out. So um, there's some updating that needs to happen, but it's basically ready to go. But so, and, you know, school administrators have to do professional development annually. Um, to keep to keep up their license so you know one of the options for them is going to be this course on um, the importance and the value of school libraries in student learning so we're also um, in the early early stages of trying to develop some modules um, that would hopefully be in those educator training programs at the academic level so they will learn about school libraries before they ever enter the workforce as an administrator and have some kind of better understanding because we've also heard a lot of stories from school librarians who have said you know the you know I mentioned that resource that we created the value of school libraries you know a couple of them have said after I showed that to my administrator um, now they're going to hire an aide or now they're going to you know they're not going to decrease the staff they're going to keep it the same and they were planning to cut um, things like that but they also have said you know their entire attitude about funding for the school library has changed. A lot of school librarians have discretionary spending. So if they they might have a base amount that they know they're getting, but anything above that, they've got to go to their administrator every single time. And it's a yes, no. So if the administrator doesn't see the value in what they're trying to do or what they think they need to add, then you know the burden is, is on them to prove that value and then to also um, prove its worth. So it's one of those things that, you know, Part, another piece of this is the education for librarians in how to advocate for themselves, whether it's through this dashboard tool or, like I mentioned before, some of the information that they already have on collection statistics, um, their circulation numbers, and then they're also their student library visit data. That's something that I think is a, a big uh, discrepancy between public libraries and school libraries. Um, public libraries, they always track who's coming in and out of the door, right? Like gate counters are kind of the norm. For most public libraries, school librarians, the majority of them do not know how many students visit their library every day. So, you know, just even helping them set up a simple Google form so kids can log in and out, or they, I mean, a lot of them have said they just start tally sheets 
So it's maybe not as accurate, but it's at least something, um, you know, for them to have an idea. And I, we just did a professional development event in um, Champaign earlier this month. And one of the librarians who was at a session I did last fall in, at the IELTS conference came up to me and said, after seeing your, your talk about using data, she's like, I started doing this. And what she figured, she was doing, collecting her visit information um, on the quarter. So her school is on four quarters for the year. So she was doing first quarter, second quarter, third quarter. And what she didn't realize is she has 300 extra students coming to visit the library every quarter outside of their regularly scheduled time. So um, many of those students she's seeing five and six times. So she's like, I had no idea, but now I know. And she's like, in my, she's like, my principal could not believe that that's the traffic. So I, I think it's just, you know, sometimes raising the awareness of what you, you, you already have information or you have the ability to collect the information and it can have a big impact. Absolutely. Yeah, and having having and having something like this in addition to those numbers could really transform the opinions and the attitudes of those uh, stakeholders. Absolutely. Right. Uh, well, I'm not seeing any other questions. Uh, okay. As you mentioned, a fairly quiet group. That's okay. <laughs> um, you, we again. This was recorded. You will all have access to the recorded version of this. Um, we'll put it up on the Rails YouTube page, and I'll send you all a link. Um, Jeanette. I really want to thank you so much for for putting this together and and presenting this. Uh, I I learned a lot here today, and and I hope everyone did as well. Um, you will always have access to that Slate Data dashboard uh, through the Rails website. Um, and uh, any any last words, Jeanette, that you want to share with the group? No, again, thank you so much for your time and for joining us today. I if I really do encourage anybody who has questions to reach out. I'm happy to either just correspond by email or if you want to set up the time to talk one-on-one, -on -one, we can do that as well. Um, I've had a couple school librarians contact me to go through their data specifically, and I'm happy to do that as well. Yeah, that's awesome. That that I could see that being really useful. So, okay. Well, thank you all. Have a wonderful Wednesday, and uh, we will see you later. Thanks. Bye, all.